from the campus studios of Sarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tisha. Hello and welcome to another Ropecast. Today again, my partner Peter is not here, so I welcome back Chris, and who is actually very much responsible for these Ropecasts in that he deals with everything except what we're doing right now, and that is speaking. <laughs> Hi, folks. I want to make use of your knowledge today because we're going to look at tweets. And I'm not a Twitter user, so yeah. what can you say about Twitter? Well, it's a social network. Um, people comment and are forced to comment very briefly yeah. um, instead of precisely. That doesn't always go together. So there's a, quite a severe limit on the number of characters? Yes, it used to be 140 characters, and I think they doubled that amount. So okay. now you can post up to 280 letters. But it isn't that strict if you want to post links, for example. They uh, are not yes. counted right. into into that And limit. what about photos? Um, as well, that yeah. would only be an addition and not counted into right. the limit. But the actual message has to be very concise. Yeah. So it um, will be unusual to use whole sentences, for example. Yeah, usually you have some ellipses, to use the technical term. Yeah. So you ha don't have verbs, you have shortened forms, you use uh, infinite forms to express what you would otherwise express in a whole sentence or right. dependent clause. Well, this is the background to, um, to looking at the way um, President Trump uses tweets. Mm -hmm. In fact, we can go further back because... There's already been academic research into Trump tweets going back, I suppose, from when Twitter first started. Trump was a businessman, and then he was on television. He became very well known through a, a te television show. Um, we have information then about the way he's used tweets over quite a period of years. Yeah, it should be the early 2000s then. Yes, yes. And then from when he became a candidate right through to the present time when, as president, he's still tweeting quite a lot. And as we mentioned in the most recent Ropecast, we have to be a little bit careful about authorship. You tend to think that tweets must come from the man himself. But in fact, linguistic studies have already revealed that there are some tweets coming from his account which cannot have been written by Trump himself because they're simply not in line with the way Trump uses English. Mm. And I wonder whether that's in line with the usage policies they have in place. You're not, a, you're not allowed to share your password with others. Well, um, whatever the reasons, <laughs> there, are, there are some tweets which probably didn't come from uh, Trump himself. And how do we know? Well, from careful linguistic analysis of uh, the way they're structured, um, the words used, the way things are phrased... So even without whole sentences, you can actually discover quite a lot about the origin of messages. I can imagine that maybe the, the methods of shortening of ellipses in itself are, are maybe telling there. Mm -hmm. Well, for anyone who's interested in the technicalities, there is very careful academic research into these things already, and we will put the link on yeah, the website I'll do that. for those who, who want to take a look. And what these two linguists have um, discovered through very thorough, careful research is, first of all, perhaps unsurprisingly, the tweets emanating from Trump have developed over the years. But also, if you do uh, what is called a multidimensional analysis, you can find that the tweets are used for different purposes. Mm -hmm. so for example, one purpose um, they call promotion, that is promoting an idea, not necessarily a product. So the early ones, when he was on television, would be, for example, promoting his show or um, a, a show by somebody else that he admired. So that, that's given the heading promotion. And certain linguistic features are quite evident when that is the purpose of the tweet. Is there a category for stepping on international leaders' toes? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps there is, but <laughs> not so far in this research. Another one is critique. Um, of course, tweets are very often used to criticize people or that offices would, or That would groups. be the one then. Possibly that one. Um, there's also a thing called opinion. So you see, these, although they may have some overlap, linguistically speaking, they're pretty clear categories. And there's a mm -hmm. rise and fall according to, for example, what is Trump interested in? Mm -hmm. So let's just take opinion, because people tend to assume that what you get from a Trump tweet is Trump's opinion. That's probably one of the favorite categories. So that um, the kind of 
linguistic features that are used when he is expressing an opinion reach, for example, one peak when Trump was trying to claim that President Obama had not been born in the United States. Now, this became known as the birther claim <laughs> from the birth, where, where are you born? And in the end, um, Obama felt obliged to publicize his birth certificate to show you that I was born in the United States. Uh -huh. So there's, there's a peak in certain features of Trump tweets at this period when opinion is, is the major factor. I see. And then once he declared his candidacy for the president, there's again a steep rise in these linguistic features in his tweets. Mm -hmm. Which one? The opinion again? The opinion, yes. So again, he thinks probably expressing his opinions is important as a candidate. Then I got um, interested in the work of um, a British scientist from a completely different field, um, not a linguist, but um, a social scientist, a psychologist, who has, among other things, studied leadership mm -hmm. and group behavior, which, which go together. Mm -hmm. He started off by studying groups, and he found groups inevitably have a leader. Either they choose one or one emerges. Mm -hmm. And through the work of uh, Professor Stephen Reicher, I think we can see pretty clearly how Trump created for himself a group that he could lead. And, of course, these are the people who then elected him to the office of President of the United States. And it's, it's a fascinating area of study. Interesting dynamics there, yes, yeah. Yes. So we, we should definitely look into that again. I think so, yes. Looking forward to that. Right. So I'll come back the next time. Excellent. Great. So that's all for today. Thank you for listening. And until next time. See ya. Bye. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial.